questions again. Okay, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, I'll officially call to order the regular meeting of Coachella Valley Water District Board of Directors, October 25, 2022, here in Coachella. And uh, let me start with some introductory remarks. I'd like to make clear for the record that this meeting is being conducted as permitted under AB 361 and Board Resolution 2022-10. Today's meeting is presented in a hybrid format in person at CBW's Coachella office and via Zoom. AB 361 suspends certain requirements of the Brown Act, allowing district board members to participate in person or by video conference. Members of the public may participate in person or via Zoom. Zoom details are listed on the meeting agenda, and if that doesn't work on our website, cbw.org, just go where it says uh, meeting agendas. Uh, the meeting is streamed live on the district's website and YouTube channel. Members of the public who wish to comment on an item on the agenda or within the jurisdiction of the district have three minutes. Public comment may be provided in person, via Zoom, or by emailing the clerk of the board. Such comments will become part of the board meeting record. Um, we do have one board member attending remotely today, so I'll make sure that we call on on them and have plenty of opportunity for remote input, and all of our um, and all of our uh, votes will be by roll call. That covers that, I think. And so, uh, would you please stand and join me in the pledge of allegiance? President Powell. Here. And Vice President Estrada will be absent today. Director Bianco. Here. Director Aguilar. Here. And Director Nelson. Here. Here. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Do we have any additions, deletions, or adjustments to today's agenda? No, sir. Not that I'm aware of, and I don't see anybody raising their hands to correct me. So I think Are we're we going to drop one item from the... Uh, Yes, session. we will drop actually several items. Several. Um, we had uh, listed all of the uh, Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association versus Coachella Valley Water District, and we will hold off on those discussions until uh, November. There has been... So that's uh, D through... It's 13D through 13... N is in November. And, yeah. and we will also drop uh, one of the 13As, anticipated litigation as well. Correct. Okay. So 13A is gone. And then one, one, of the, one of the three cases on 13A is gone. Okay. Oh, okay, just one. So we should be out of here by 8.30. So there's two cases on 13A yeah. instead of three. Okay. Uh, is there anybody from the public wishing to comment at this time? Yes, sir, one. of contract and not knowing which way uh, the board had even considered, if even the conversation has come up in a regular district uh, meeting. And But there are other meetings going on regarding the topic, uh, one of them uh, a commission known as the Coachella Valley Energy Commission meets regularly on the second Thursday of each month. and. Um, it's very helpful for the community to keep up with what what is going on, if you will, uh, during this uh, 
these last 10 years of the contract before it expires. And as a, as a community member and resident and uh, rate payer, user of the Coachella Valley Water District Services and the Imperial Irrigation District, I've, I've, I've seen the benefit long-term and, you know, the immediate benefits and long-term benefits uh, of the existing contract and the uh, possible uh, extension of an agreement with the Imperial Irrigation District. And you can stop me any time you think I'm out of line here. <laughs> if it's not, it's not the right time to talk about this. But I think it is because uh, there's a lot of things going on, if you will, during these conversations with the Coachella Valley Energy Commission. And one of those things that's going on is the consideration of forming special little districts or assessment uh, uh, fees, let's just say, that could tag on with uh, either the continuance of the Coachella Valley Water District's uh, uh, um, agreement with the IID or without it. And so that's one of my major concerns because, and I, I really, I really, if you will, I'm attached to both districts because I've been a lifetime user and beneficiary of the services. And one of the things that I pride myself on and I, I, I like to share with other people who ask about our Coachella Valley is that our districts, our service providers, power and energy and even to some degree, the gas company. Uh, those utility companies work as as part of our economic structure, and in in our own um, in our own, um, if you will, mission statement. Uh, the Coachella Valley Water District is formed to meet the water-related needs of the people to dedicated employees providing high quality water at a reasonable cost. I really believe that. I really believe that. It's, it's proven itself historically, and I think that there's no reason why it can't continue based on the leadership, the team that you've got working with you, staff, employees out in the field. I've been one. I've, I've worked for the Coachella Valley Water District. I know, if you will, the soul, the heart of everybody that's involved. So I think I stand up here with some sort of, let's just say, like to stand on, if you will, because of the fact of my relationship. And the IID, in their writings, in their documentation, they also state that they're not a for-profit agency. And, and, and the history proves that. And that's one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that a lot of these people that are trying to take advantage of this dissolution, of this agreement, let's just say, are leaning on what you're not charging enough. You're not charging the people enough. I mean, even the city manager of Indio recently uh, mentioned uh, having met with the Coachella Valley Water District. I don't know. I haven't seen it on the minutes or anything like that. I might have missed that meeting. Of course, I did because I'm relatively new to some of your most recent meetings. Uh, Mr. Luna, I'm sorry. He's planning to make a presentation in open session at the next at our next meeting. I'm sorry. The, the city manager of India is planning to, is on the agenda for our next meeting. Oh, good. Yeah, and will that be here or in Palm, in Palm Desert? Okay, thank you. Uh, either way, uh, just to kind of get a little bit of, uh, let's just say, background here, the city manager of India has already or, or says meet, mentioned meeting with the Coachella Valley Water District. Discussion was, past tense, potentially an overall increase in rates for Coachella Valley. Now, whether he's talking about increase in Coachella Valley Water District, increase in the IID rates, I know the city of India is already charging a 1.05 something percent use fee for per hundred or thousand kilowatt. Am I right? Am I wrong? Are you kind of like? You no, no, no. I was just uh, mentioning the time. Oh. Your comments. Right. Okay. And, so, if you would like to wrap it, if you could wrap it up. Then. Okay, I, 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 I thank you so much. Um, either way, what I, my bottom line is that even with just a sort of an imprimatur of some other activity on the outside, it still increases rates and we would be a part of it. And I think that it's a bigger picture than just what we might, might see immediately. And so I encourage the board to really give it some deep thought and 
do a lot of research into some of these things, into how the economic, uh, how it would impact our Coachella Valley residents, users, et cetera, uh, thank you. on the long term. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and, and just for, apologies for yeah, to clarify, as I understand it, the city of India is considering adding something to the rate for IID energy customers in the city of India. There they are. I've got the bills to prove it. Yeah. Oh, so you're you're a resident of the city of India. My son. I, I have family in India. Your son, and yeah. So that that's the scope of their effort yeah. is is yeah. within their city limits. So you put a one percent here and a one percent there, and, be, and you know it starts going up and up, and there goes Jarvis Gann out the window. Right. There you go. All right. Thank you for your comments. And I'll just ask, Mr. President, we do have um, a couple of attendees on Zoom, so if there's any members of the public that would like to provide uh, comment, please use the raise hand feature at this time, or you can do star six to unmute yourself. Okay, I don't see any at this time. Thank you. Uh, so no, apparently we have no further public comment at this time based on what we're seeing. Uh, moving on to uh, special presentations and recognitions. We have um, two anniversaries and a retirement. I believe That's it. Matt is here, and uh, we'll do that last. But just to mention, we have a 20-year anniversary, uh, Todd Anoki, electrical crew chief, and then a retirement, Armando Pacheco, Mechanical Technician 2 with 20 years. So thank you to both of them and congratulations. Uh, we also have an anniversary with uh, Matt Lautzenheiser, uh, Auto Shop Supervisor, 20 years. Matt began his career with CVWD in 2002 as an Auto Shop Technician. He came with an impressive background having owned his own transmission repair shop for several years. Over the next 12 years, Matt was the go-to technician and in 2014 was promoted to a maintenance and training technician where he shared his knowledge with his peers and developed training programs such as the forklift and air brake courses that were utilized to train employees outside of the auto shop. In 2016, Matt was promoted to crew chief and in 2017 promoted to his current position as the auto shop supervisor. Matt leads by example, and the changes he's made have resulted in more streamlined process for the vehicle and equipment repairs. Matt has earned the respect of not only those in the auto shop, but has, has developed an incredibly positive working relationship throughout the district. Matt's leadership has resulted in a loyal and dedicated team committed to providing the absolute best service and ensure safe and reliable vehicles and equipment. Matt and his wife Heather have two children. His daughter Faith is starting her sophomore year at Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, and his son Hayden is a senior in high school and plays on the high-level club hockey team. I'm assuming that's ice hockey. Yes. Yes. Okay, <laughs> good. All right, well, and so congratulations coming up, 20-year anniversary, and we'll have a little photo. you want to make? Yeah, I get a couple. Should I sit down? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, 22 years ago, I, um, I owned a transmission shop and I was working 12, 14 hours a day and my wife came to me and said she was pregnant with, uh, was uh, going to be our daughter. And I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to be able to, you know, be part of my kid's life. Uh, working 12 to 14 hours a day, you know, what am I going to miss? And I had some friends that worked here at the Water District and did some work for some people at the Water District. And they uh, told me how great it was. So over a period of a year, five applications, and three interviews later, uh, I applied for everything except the auto shop because I didn't want to be a mechanic anymore. <laughs> and lo and behold, I fell into the auto shop. And now 20 years later, uh, I never missed a hockey game. I made it to all the volleyball That's games. 
I had uh, vacations with the family in places I didn't think I'd be able to go. And uh, it's all due to, you know, working here and, and getting busy. So I uh, extend my appreciation um, to the board for giving us uh, almost everything we want. Uh, not quite everything, but you give us That's my fault. We give you what we need. <laughs> and uh, any success I've had, uh, I, I mean, Dan and Stu are a great management team, but I mean, honestly, uh, everything that I get done uh, is due to the outstanding crew that I got. They're a high level set of technicians. They make it easy to look good. So, good. anyway, good. thank I you. really appreciate your comments. Thank you. Right. Thank you. to item six, which is our consent calendar. We have a number of items there. Item, item 6A through M as in Mary. I, I'd like to uh, pull 6K. K, which is the uh, uh, local CEQA. Mr. President, I'll move the balance of the uh, consent agenda. All second. Okay, good. Um, roll call vote, please. President Powell? Aye. Director Bianco? Aye. Director Aguilar? Aye. And Director Nelson? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, go ahead. So we're on K. Here. So you don't have to go into the all of it. It's pretty lengthy. Sure. I just was um, curious. To me, I'm thinking that CEQA is, 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 there's a set of rules, okay, and that everybody abides by the same set of rules, right, okay, and it seems like we have our own different tweaks to that, and is that normal? Uh, I'd say, yeah, it is normal. I mean, we do abide by all the same rules. We're not changing any of the rules. In 2019, we did a comprehensive update for the first time since the 80s. We've stayed with BB&K's Program 5 since that time, and every year they update our local CEQA guidelines on an annual basis to reflect the changes that have occurred at the state level and also at the local level. The only thing we really do different that um, you know, is specific to CVWD is provide clarification and examples that we've gleaned on from the previous year. Interpretations of, our, of um, a project of the, that is exempt or exemptions that have come f uh, from the water code for Sigma, things like that. There's just minor additions, but it in general... It like the, there's language in there that's specific to the way we want to conduct ourselves with the CEQA process. So I, I didn't I didn't know why we weren't following a standard procedure. It seems like there's, you know, this is what is, is, was written just for CBWD, but right. so apparently it's written it, by the lawyers who, who write this right. for the, all of the water districts. Yeah, the, in, the intent is to clarify how CEQA may apply to your district. There's the state CEQA guidelines, and then there's the guidelines within CEQA that says all agencies must adopt their own right. local CEQA guidelines. And that helps to interpret the generalized um, rules for CEQA for each agency. Right. Okay. And so our program is we spread the cost among 200 public agency clients of updating and recommending what needs to be done on an annual basis if anything needs to be updated for your own local CEQA guidelines. So we're not going through chapter and verse of each water district's local CEQA guidelines. We're going through and seeing what laws have been changed that would require you to change certain parts of your local CEQA guidelines. But that's done on a but, firm but basis. How do you guys know what we need on our local CEQA guidelines? What what you need for your local CEQA guidelines? We, we have a colleague who works with, um, with Mr. Patterson 
in terms of what needs to be done or changed, but we have a general structure for water districts that say this law has changed for Sigma. For water districts, that needs to be included or not. But we don't do housing changes in housing codes and include that in your law. Did, did, does CBWD have input on these changes? Or, or? Oh, yeah. Okay. We go through about a four or five month process to develop these guidelines. Okay. Okay. So you've got, so we've been, staff oh, yeah. has gone through this to right. make oh, yeah. sure that it'll, it'll, okay. Okay. So then once we approve it, does the state then look at it and say yes or no? No. Um, this is their, once you do your local secret guidelines, once you implement them, if things have to be sent to the state, the state clearinghouse, a notice of exemption or a negative declaration, that's what gets approved at the state level. You're right. But okay. if you didn't have local secret the, guidelines, the guideline, then they would tell you. The guidelines themselves are, are ours. Mm -hmm. then, so we're... Mm -hmm. As long as we have them and then implement them, and then at that point, um, the, the state would be involved in any particular secret action. No, I know. I mean, this is such a complicated thing. So you have 22 attachments to this, to this thing. You there's, a ran, lot of, there's a lot of language change in it. So the majority of the attachments um, are optional for CBWD, just so you know. The, the so these are just a subset of the ones that we could have? Is that what you're saying? That's right. So we're not reinventing the wheel for the different forms. We want yeah. to make sure you have the forms every year through a portal that we send to staff. So if something needs to be changed because of the law or something that's tailored to the district, we work with staff to do that. But we're not right. regenerating all those new guidelines. Yeah. But right. So then when, when our staff or consultant is preparing a CEQA document for submission, they use our guidelines. Correct. Yeah. And we've provided a portal where all that is available for them to call up. So I would, I would just like to point out um, that I did raise a question on the guidelines um, in a separate email when this came out, specifically regarding a provision that talked about CEQA approval and who had the authority to approve uh, CEQA documents, and it suggested that there were other organizations or other agencies that could do that, and I wondered right. why. Yeah. And I was, it was explained to me, and I think, and Jeff, thank you for the explanation. So I appreciate that. I think I'm, I'm good. Okay. Okay. So we're trying to be in, in, in compliance with the law, cost effective, but yet tailor it where needed for the district in working with your staff. Fair enough. Good. And we do this every year. I mean, I, we've seen this before. Correct. So I guess if we get complaints from <laughs> that then we'll know that there's something in here. Well, if something, yeah, we submit a secret document and it doesn't... Uh, you mean a complaint from the public, or? Yeah, a complaint from, from that it's difficult to comply with. I mean, I, I, I don't know if there's. Oh. It, it, yeah, we're not, we're not adding procedures. We're it seems like we're adding procedures. Well, we're I mean, not, it yeah. seems like it's, it seems like it when you read it, that we're adding more procedures to it. <laughs> but oh, no, we're I, I'm not an expert on <laughs> SQL. I'm not an expert on SQL. I just. <laughs> We're not adding any steps. We may be tailoring things to what the district's done in the past. Okay. What may be lost here is that each year legislators adopt new rules for CEQA, and that is what's triggering this action. We have to add, we have to make changes to comply, like an exemption for a needle syringe giveaway services. The state adopted a rule that you don't need to comply with CEQA for those needle exchange programs. So we had to change our local guidelines to include that exemption. Okay. An exemption for when you build uh, restoration habitat projects. You no longer, you have an exemption now for CEQA. That's a new rule. So we're updating our guidance to include it. And every year, there's constant changes, so that's why you're likely to see us each year with a change to our guidelines. Okay. Thank you. Good explanation from both of you. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, that's good. Uh, is there a motion to approve 6K?
I'll make a motion. Is there a second? I want to make sure. I want to make sure Director Nelson's still with us. But you don't have to second it. Just let us know you're there. I'm with I'm you, John. John. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll second it then. Um, roll call vote, please. Sure. President Bell. Aye. Director Bianco. Aye. Director Aguilar. Aye. And Director Nelson. Aye. Aye. Thank you. So that, that passed 4 0. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we have three items on the action calendar, I believe. Yes. The first 8A is uh, task order four. Looks like David Wilson's coming up for the quarry connection to our non-potable. This is Colorado River water. Yes. Good morning. Hi, David. Uh, the purpose of this item is to authorize the general manager to execute task order number four. Steward, Incorporated. Turn the mic on, mic on, please. Apologies. I'll start over. So red is on. <laughs> yes. Uh, purpose of this item is to authorize the general manager to execute task order number four with Krieger and Stewart Incorporated uh, in the amount of $80,900 to develop a feasible feasibility study for providing Colorado River water to the Quarry Country Club. The total cost of this request, which includes $15,000 for project management and engineering, and $10,000 for contingency is $105,900. Uh, the purpose of the project is to ascertain the means for providing Colorado River water from Lake Cahuilla uh, to the quarry, uh, develop a cost-benefit analysis that will inform a go-no-go -go decision on whether it's beneficial to, to develop a project um, in the name of the or in lieu recharge program. Uh, the total cost of this, again, is $105,900. It is budgeted in the East uh, Valley Replenishment Fund in the amount of $150,000. Therefore, there is no adverse impact to the budget. And with that, I will take any questions. So, so if we do go forward, do we think the cost of this project is around $2.5 million? That's 2.4. So 2.4, yeah. What's what the overall projection of water use from this project? I'm sorry. The overall projection of water use, I think you said. Uh, they take about 3,500 um, GPM per day, uh, which equates to, forgive me. It's got to be eight or 900 acre feet, right? Yeah, it's about 900 acre feet a year. I'm sorry, Director Nelson, was that your question about how much water use uh, did we expect from the quarry? That was, that was it. it. Thank you, Jim. Hi, sir. Okay. I just wonder, I mean, do we really have a hurdle? How do we know if the cost benefit is a go or a no go? What's the hurdle, you know, the hurdle rate or the, I mean, if, if it, so if it costs more than X, we're not going to do it. And if it costs less, we will. I mean, what's that number? Well, I think that that's, that's, that's the scope is to figure out what that number should be. I mean, the issue for this is A, it involves installing a pump station at Lake, at Lake Ouya. Um, it also involves uh, traversing through the city and through the country club's uh, streets, which is, you know, relatively normal. Their consumption, again, is 3,500 gallons per minute over a span of five hours, which is significant. Uh, and so the goal of the project would be to figure out if there's a happy medium in terms of, you know, uh, spreading out that delivery over time, minimizing the, the cost of the pump station uh, use. And then this is effectively at the edge of the aquifer, and so the question uh, remains as to whether the benefit um, in the name of in lieu recharge is is there as it relates to the cost right and uh, i'm not aware of our, our district having any policy that might say 
in lieu recharge is better or worse than direct recharge? Do we have anything like that? I mean, I, I mean, personally, I think that in lieu is better, but you know, it's more. It seems like a more uh, a less invasive way to do the get the job done. You know, because you're not going in and out. No, sir. I'm not aware of a policy that we well, currently have. Well, well, one, the district is is getting money for 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 the water. <laughs> And the other one, the the district is paying to put the. Well, we're paying for the initial, but then they would they would buy the water after that. Well, you have a customer. Yeah, well. I mean you're gonna have a customer either way because either they're pumping water and paying the east rack, or which which in turn pays the canal fund for the water, uh, or um, they're gonna pay the non potable, which eventually is gonna pay the canal fund. But, but there's but there's maintenance in the in the recharge. No, there's there's a lot of maintenance yeah. at, at um, no no I, I I mean I think in lieu you have this upfront cost but but we so we don't have we haven't really valued one over the other is what I'm, I, my point you know I mean these are things that I don't know if that's in the scope either but um, you know I've never heard us doing a cost benefit analysis of one of these projects <laughs> we just kind of do the projects. We take the next one in line and we go. Right. Yeah. But now we're looking at it. I'm just wondering, what are the parameters? I mean, what? When does it fail? What? You know, and I guess that's in the scope. But isn't that really for us to decide? I mean, so if yeah. you take two and a half million dollars for the project and and it's 900 acre feet, that's 2,700 dollars an acre foot, one time cost, mm -hmm. right? Because you're going to save that 900 every year, uh, as far as converting from one source to the other. And, and so the question is, does that make sense? I mean, I don't know that we've ever really done a <coughs> modeling of it to decide what the number is. You know? no, we have not. It, and, and we have not done return. I'm sorry. We have not, and we have not done return on investment, and we have not prioritized um, based on cost basis. The guidance uh, to staff has been um, get people off of groundwater, use the Colorado River water, use the recycled water um, wherever we can regardless of cost. The idea was to protect the aquifer. Yeah, I understand. So so why are we considering this? It seems like a whole new direction. Why are we doing it? Yeah, well, this is this is the last one, if you will, that's, that's on the East east Valley. Everything else has been on the Valley floor. Uh, and it seems intuitive that that would be an immediate benefit to the aquifer. It's kind of low-hanging fruit in terms of, instead of building a recharge facility, Albeit we have the the levy, which this is uh, upstream of of the levy, so this this area, correct me if I'm wrong, does not benefit from replenishment um, on the levy side. But again, it's also on the fringe. Well, with, if if it's with if it's <coughs> within the area of benefit, it must benefit from the levy. They're paying they're paying the rack, right? Yes. So so we're going to strike that contract. Yeah, mine's it's, yes, it's a mistake. It's yeah. Poorly stated, but. <laughs> yeah. If they're not, then they shouldn't be You're paying right. the rack. You're right. And I'm sure that if they're listening, they would probably have that same concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's um, that's essentially it. This this, this golf club uh, has some stringent requirements to deliver water. Uh, it's 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 not something we've done before. Put a pump station at the at Lake Owea. Uh, there is the operational component. Um, the potential for putting it, what we're proposing to put it, is right near what we deliver to the 120-345, and so it's just it was just slightly different, and we thought the the uh, best approach would be to develop a feasibility study and look at a cost benefit and see if it is worth spending the dollars in this particular project to develop it. I it's, it's potentially. Uh, I guess it's possible that it, this study would come back and say, no, it's not feasible. This seems pretty it's, remote. It's not going to happen. How is that going to happen? So they're going to say 2,700 doesn't make sense? I mean, based on what? Well, based on the delivery and the cost. Yeah, but we've done other ones that I'm sure have been way above that. No? Not in the East Valley that I can think of. I don't know. I don't have that information. It just seems maybe if we had that information, 
we have our estimates, right? And they're probably going to use our estimates. They're going to use their actual production, which we should have available to us. I don't think we know that number. That's fine. It's, it's, it's better than, than them coming and saying it's approve it or don't approve it, the whole project. It's, it's well, I think the intent here also is just to be prudent with, with the expenditures. I mean, if we don't do a feasibility study, the question then is, do we proceed with the project? Right. So well, if we don't do the feasibility study, I would have to guess that we are not moving forward with the project. So are they going to look at our cost estimate and decide if it's wrong or change it? Well, they're going to look at the, the means for delivering water and whether our cost estimate makes sense in terms of how we, we've figured out an alignment to take it there. We're going to look at the delivery to the golf to the golf club, their consumption, and how we can best, you know, um, minimize the burden uh, on the district in terms of the size of the pump station and the size of the pipe. Are they going to meet? They're going to meet with the people at, at the quarry. Oh yeah, for sure. That's and, part of the scope. That's part of the feasibility. We would go over the operational parameters, theory of operation. I don't know. It sounds like stuff we probably do anyways. If they do it or we do it. trying to understand why we're changing how we do things. An extra 105 grand. So if we said no to this, we would just probably just go forward with the project? I would probably say no. Because? Because the board's not interested in looking at the costs. But we sort of laid out the costs. We already kind of have an idea of what it is. So we're concerned that our estimates are not accurate? Well, we did put out an RFP that included design uh, for the project. We could expand on that. And we have in the past had the board ask us, what kind of analysis have you done on whether or not this makes sense? No, I get that. And we've I've seen, there's a chart somewhere. I've seen a couple of projects laid out, and this is the cost breaker foot. Mm -hmm. but, but, and sometimes, you know, it's converting sources. Sometimes it's actually saving water. Um, Hi, Carrie. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to add, okay, when we asked for proposals for this project, we asked for them to um, break it into, like, two phases. And the first one was this preliminary feasibility study, um, kind of the cost-benefit analysis, and then the second one is design. So um, if we were to just go with the whole thing and just say we're going to do this, and we're going to design it, and we're not going to worry about the costs. Um, we would still spend this hundred and five thousand plus a little extra for the design. Um, the reason we scoped it that way is so that we can still use this consultant if we decide we want to move forward with yeah. the design. Okay. But I guess to more to your point though of why are we changing things? I'm not sure that we're really changing things too much. It's just this. This is one of the. Um, more expensive or a little more challenging connections that we've had in the East Valley. Um, typically they don't include pump stations and they don't include long lengths of pipe. And so we just wanted to make sure that we reviewed that information first before we just dive into design. Um, the other non potable water projects that we've done have been mostly from Warp 10 or Warp 7. Uh, most warp 10 really where it's a blend it's recycled water and Colorado River water so we do have cost per acre foot for all of those types of projects and, and, and so what we could right. do is compare it but we've also done some recent connections in the East Valley but our Madison Club I mean we did we did all that stuff near the L4 pump station that hooked up I think a couple courses in right mountain course and the, those kind of things right that was that was um, not, I don't think, directly to, I mean, that was, that was a little of a system improvement because that involved installing a lot of right, that distribution one was big, pipelines. But, but and, so say, let's say Madison Club. That was maybe the last one we did. Right, uh, and that was just mostly a, a meter and a vault in the telemetry. So it was a lot cheaper. And it, there wasn't a pump station involved. Okay, yeah. fair enough. No, and, and you, you kind of address my concern too because I had a feeling we we're going to do this anyways so so let's do it and then we can always 
Right, and then get we a better can, sense we, of whether we, we should proceed. Yeah, we can decide. Yeah. Is it in the range of what the warp ten, warp sure. seven connections cost? And okay. then we can just move on with design. And but we would bring that back to you before right. we move to design. Of course. Yeah. Of course. All right. Yeah, if you could include a little bit of data on other yeah, projects, right. just to get a sense of where it fits in the, Exactly. That would be helpful. Yeah, we will. Thank you. Okay. I'm all right with it. It's good. So good. Is that a motion? Uh, I'll move approval of 8A. <laughs> <laughs> you want He's to trying to move us along. <laughs> uh, is there a second? Second. I'll, I'll second, second, John, and then, and then uh, the uh, question that I, well, 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 I guess, I guess the, the direction, direction that I have would be that, that uh, um, we, we get a report as to kind of a comparative analysis of what the uh, costs are uh, comparing the, the, the recharge, um, you know, kind of methodology where you just, you know, percolate it into the ground and they pull it out versus you know, a project like this that would have some ongoing costs. So I, I guess that, that would be my, my hope for the project. Do you guys understand that? I mean, forgive me, Anderson. Can I just say something? Don't we have our own IT guys? Don't we have a slew of IT guys? Can't we get somebody in here to, 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 to fix this place? I mean, it can't be that big. <laughs> Peter, <laughs> Peter, you just so you know, we have we quite a bit of reverb on it. hire a company to come in and fix it, or can we just fix it? Yeah, I, I can't even hear Anthony. I, I don't know what's going on. So oh, part of the problem. Oh, his, mic, oh, his mic was off. No, he's, he's just he's venting a little. He's just venting a little on the reverb. But you, your, your last few words did not have a reverb, so maybe keep doing that. And if you could repeat the question, that would be helpful. <laughs> the question is, uh, I'm hoping that this project has a comparative analysis of the thought that you brought up, uh, John, was that is it a better methodology to just put it in the ground at right here at this site or to, you know, pump it out of Lake Kauia? You know, it, it ought to have a comparative analysis of the two methodologies. I don't think we can put it into the ground without pumping it out of Lake Kauia. I don't, I'm, so I'm, I'm not sure what we're comparing. You're comparing the existing situation where they're paying the rack versus oh, this project that they're, uh, that now we're going to pump it and what the costs are to the district and what the costs are to the customer. Okay. Yeah, kind of getting back to the earlier, is it better to do in lieu? And I guess for this specific project, is it better just to deliver the water to Levy and let them use their wells or to do what this project proposes, which is to pr so provide surface water to them? Yes, so, that would be a part of the feasibility study. Th so they'll be looking at that? Yes. So the alternative or the, the no project alternative is just keep recharging it. That's correct. And keep using the well. And the cost okay. associated. Fair enough. And I think I heard a second from a couple, yes. couple people. You got that? Yeah. All right. Are we ready to vote? I think we are. Um, uh, then uh, roll call vote, please. President Powell. Aye. Director Bianco. Aye. Director Aguilar. Aye. And Director Nelson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks. Thanks, David. David. So B is, uh, is these uh, two hydro pneumatic tank replacements. Three tanks. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Here to request authorization to go out to bid for three hydro pneumatic tanks. And so uh, one is in Bombay Beach, two are in Rancho Mirage. And by way of background, we have about 160 tanks in our system. Uh, these tanks range in age from 42 years old to about 60 years old. And over time, uh, just like our water tanks, uh, they're susceptible to corrosion when the coatings fail. So in our CIP budget, we budgeted $200,000 annually to start uh, re um, rehabbing these tanks and actually re replacing them. So today, this is to uh, go out to bid for three of the tanks. If the project costs exceed what the board is comfortable approving, we would delete one of the tanks to stay within that $200,000 budget. But again, this is something that we feel is very important. Uh, these are pressurized vessels. They do provide some storage uh, for our hydro pneumatic uh, systems out there, and so we feel it's very important to do ongoing uh, replacement of these tanks. It'll take us a while to get through all the 160 tanks, 
Uh, we have replaced four of them in the past. So this is just a continuation of that project. Sure. Uh, really good question. So uh, these tanks are filled partially with air and with water. So for hydropneumatic systems, it means we don't have a, a tank on a hill. So these tanks are pressurized and they push out water when someone turns on their kitchen faucet or flush their toilet. And so the pressures in these tanks, you know, can range about 100 psi plus or minus. And so this keeps our pumps from always having to run all the time because there is some storage for our, our hydro pneumatic systems. So they're really integral part of uh, our system. In some cases we've had to valve these tanks off just because of their age and corrosion. So what ends up happening is our pumps run all the time, all the time, because there is no storage here. So the, so the wells fill up the pressure tanks, hydromatic tanks, and then the water comes out of there and then the well fills up those when it gets to a certain level. Uh, it, Yes, in general, and so the tanks can be filled up by a booster station, for example, down, down the road, miles away. So yes, and most of these systems are, are located up in higher areas where we can't put a tank up on a hill or far away in remote areas. So the drinking water system is pressurized, right? And sanitation is just gravity. So if we don't have a reservoir up on a hill that provides that constant head pressure, these are able to supplement that pressure in certain parts of the distribution system so that we don't have to keep running pumps. These can also provide that, that head pressure. So we use our boosters to create the pressure inside Correct. the you know, hydro-pneumatic tanks. Yes. So the pumps turn off. This is pressurized. It provides water pressure. And then when somebody turns on their tap, it, it won't. Bleeds off it some probably, of that it'll bleed off some of it, but probably not enough that you need to recharge Correct. it. Correct. Okay. Correct. Gotcha. I don't remember replacing these since I've been here. Uh, we we replaced a lot of, we a lot of big tanks. Yeah, we, we've only uh, done one phase, and so that was, boy, probably five, six years ago, I think. Okay. And what do you do with the old ones when you get rid of them? Uh, scrap them. Most of them are, are corroded. Cut them up? Uh, yes. And, and there's salvage value that the constructors Steve, can make. Sorry, I just wanted to make the point, too. We have we have these at every well site because they also assist with water hammer. So if um, a, a well shuts off suddenly or a valve closes suddenly, it, um, it absorbs that water hammer that could potentially be there. So we do have an active um, hydropneumatic tank replacement program. We, we only get about $100,000, $200,000 annually in the budget, but this was a strategic initiative um, from our last strategic planning um, a few years ago. To do $200,000 a year is the... Um, to... to um, to, to, yeah, to make sure that we're staying up on this replacement program. Okay. Yeah, and, and then that the $200,000 seems to be what the budget um, will afford. Okay, good. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve this uh, item? Also Thanks, moved. Gary. Motion from Director Nelson. Is there a second? Second. Um, roll call vote, please. President Powell? Aye. Director Bianco? Aye. Director Aguilar? Aye. And Director Nelson? Aye. Thank you. Then our final uh, action item is this uh, construction contract for the Adam Street Water Main Replacement Project. Dan. Right. Yes. Good morning again. So Good morning. on August 23rd, staff received board authorization to, to go out to bid for this project. And so uh, this is about 14,000 feet of pipe that we would replace with 24-inch ductile iron zinc coated pipe with polyethylene encasement. The reason why we want to replace this pipeline is uh, almost five years ago it, it failed Good catastrophically. <laughs> and as you... You sure you want to replace it? I'm positive. <laughs> and so we know corrosion is an ongoing issue. Um, I spoke about this a few months ago. I can go into more detail if you'd like. No. This is the same area, the mm -hmm. Talavera area, yes. with the corrosive soil. Correct. I, I move approval. 
Can, can I <clears throat> I'll second, but can I ask a question, Dan? Sir? Sure. Um, I think I've I think I've stated in the past that I'd like to see the breakdown on the subcontractors uh, to see. And I know I know that we're reaching out and trying to do this, but it would help me to see who are small businesses and minority owned and women owned. So that is included as part of the board action item. As, as part of the attachments? It is. Okay. I yes. It. Thank you. So I, I second the item. Yeah. So that, and that is, is that on the, uh, that last, is that, oh, shoot. Is that the last attachment? Yeah. It, it should, it should look like must be here. this. It's, ZB. it's got three of them listed there. Correct. There, no, I'm sorry. There's three. It's got the stuff for the jack and board, the pipe yeah. abandonment, and the paving. Right. DVE certification? No, no, no. Chino, Marietta, and Highland. So they are, so they are not, Correct. what does DBE stand for? Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. Yeah, they're not DBEs. No. So there is a motion and a second. Uh, roll call vote, please. President Powell. Aye. Director Bianco. Aye. Director Aguilar. Aye. And Director Nelson. Aye. Thank you. Okay, that passed for all. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Written communications. I don't see any. Do not have any. There aren't any. Uh, we do have a presentation on Geotab. Geotab. Dewar, is that you? Who's doing this? Both. Dan? I'm going to start and he's going to say the important stuff. So do people like it? That's what I want to know. I think Dan likes it. Do people like it? I mean, I'm talking about not, <laughs> not you. I, I can't tell you until the end. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's good for the district. I want to tease her. I'm just curious. The, the, whole man, the whole nanny thing. I, all right, let, let's go ahead and do your presentation. Cliffhanger. Yeah, it's a yeah. cliffhanger. Um, yeah, so we just want to give you a brief update on the, the GeoTab implementation. Um, obviously, that includes the uh, geo uh, positioning devices, the tracking mechanism, the camera, the predictive coach, which is going to be our progressive disciplinary process as far as helping teach them and guide them to change behavior. Um, as well as the uh, Lifesaver app, uh, which is blanking of the screen, so they can't use their district uh, devices uh, while the vehicle is in motion. So, so first of all, the board approved this uh, implementation uh, at the November 9th board meeting last year. Uh, we completed the installation on 434 vehicles um, in March, thanks to the auto shop. It was a, a, a large task in addition to the uh, normal work that they do. And we actually went live in mid-April. Mid um, so we've been in operation about six months overall. Um, we are still in a phase 1B where we're still pilot testing the predictive coach. Uh, we're working on some um, disciplinary uh, matrices and other things in, in order to uh, release a predictive coach on, on what the parameters are and the tolerances. And we are also, um, we just went to the Citrix cloud with most of our devices uh, in September. So we are pilot testing for the, the predictive coach within 140 vehicles. And we're testing the Lifesaver app in about 20 applications, partially phones and partially uh, uh, iPads. So that's in process. We hope to go live with those two as a 1B launch uh, in the next four to six weeks. So we have three goals of this project, in my opinion. The first one is, obviously, we're continuously evolving and increasing operational optimization. The second one is we're mitigating risk, uh, safety risk, and trying to change behavior and some of the driver uh, operational tasks, daily tasks. And I kind of an interesting horizontal bar chart. But if you look at it, um, we can show on a daily basis um, with more than 250 vehicles in operation driving on average 12,500 miles a day that we're at a 
eight, seven percent over the last seven weeks of a safety scorecard. And Stu will go into detail, but that's fantastic. And as we move along, we are changing behaviors and we can prove it with the data that we have, meaning we have 100 percent scorecards six days of the last 30 where there were no driving issues whatsoever with, with over 12,000 miles driven in that day, which I think is fantastic. Um, the other thing I would say is on the, on the right, um, we have a speed uh, chart. We monitor this daily. The first thing I do when I w w get to work uh, and a few other people, we look at this to see what the exceptions are. But if you look, our old system only had a GPS uh, and a speed every 120 seconds, and now we have it every second. So we can monitor every vehicle at all times. Um, we used to get six or more um, excessive speeds in a, in a week of 80 miles plus, and we don't typically get anything above 78, and we are working on a process that if somebody does get 78 now, we monitor that and we send an email and we use that to change the behavior to try to continue to slow them down. But without question, we can prove that they slowed down significantly and they are driving more safely. Um, we have a dashboard. These are just two or three things that we have on the dashboard, but there's probably 30 of them. Um, uh, we have total fleet miles that is in a month. Um, so we're, we're driving 60,000 miles a week and we're averaging 99.87% on a safety scorecard with five different parameters uh, that Stu will go into detail on. But I think that's extremely well done. I think we travel on average 2.8 million miles a year. And using, using data as power and using this data to change the behavior, I think uh, is extremely important and I think that it's going very well. Um, the chart, bar chart on the right shows how many miles or how many vehicles we have driving various uh, cumulative miles for the month. Uh, so we have 63 vehicles traveling more than 1,000 miles uh, a month. Uh, several of them, like the Zanharos, travel on average 3,000 miles a month. Um, and it also provides us the ability to look at idle time, fleet uh, uh, costs as far as uh, cost per mile based on debt service. We have the ability to look at the 92 vehicles that drive under 100 miles a month and, you know, now that we're hopefully getting close to post-pandemic, um, you know, to look at what we were talking about as far as having a kiosk where we get rid of some of these vehicles that are driving 20 miles a month and we amalgamate them into a kiosk whereby we just have more fleet vehicles and over time um, these people that are driving it, you know, sparingly can just go grab a vehicle kind of like a, like an enterprise, I guess, or something of the sort. Um, Dan, when you do that, yes. is there a, a locator to know who's driving? Yeah, so... So that when you get the 80 mile an hour report, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll so, be the one that gets tagged. So yeah. We have a FOB. So every driver has their own identifier, and it doesn't matter what vehicle they get in. As soon as you start the vehicle, it beeps, and you got to take the fob and scan it so that we know at all times who's in the vehicle. Um, and over and above our existing system, and again, it's not completely launched, we get anybody, we set a parameter right now at 80 miles an hour. Anybody that does that, uh, the three administrators automatically get an, an email within 60 seconds of them doing 80 miles an hour. Wow. Yeah, so it, it, it is tenfold better than the system that we had and I do you know it isn't to you know the intent is not to punish the employee the intent is to slow them down and change their behaviors and most importantly get our insurance back and mm -hmm. and get us in a safer spot and I can definitely say that we've seen significant uh, changes in our uh, in our operational culture uh, in the last six months with that I'm going to turn it over to Stu and then he'll turn it back to me on some of the vehicle policy but He'll just go into some of the details on what GeoTab offers. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Uh, so as Dan was talking about the dashboard and some of the data that is available, um, I wanted to maybe walk you down the path of what uh, the more granular details would look like in the system as we go through. Uh, so this is the, the next tab in the GeoTab platform where you would uh, go to the map. Uh, if this were a live map, you could zoom in closer and closer. You'll notice that there's the vehicle clusters. Um, 
that are throughout the map. As you zoom in, those clusters disappear and they become individual vehicles and you can see what the activities of those vehicles are. Um, you'll note that there are different shapes, uh, the squares where there are vehicles with uh, no driver name, such as right here. Uh, those would be vehicles that are parked. They're not uh, in any kind of a trip or mo operational mode at that time. Then you'll note the ones that have a driver name. That's what you were referencing. Do we know who's in a vehicle? Uh, each employee has a driver identification fob. There's an RFID reader inside the vehicle, and you simply scan into it, and it then identifies you with that particular vehicle. Uh, and then there's the vehicles that have the triangular shape to them. Those are actually in motion or uh, actively on a trip, uh, and then they point in the direction that that vehicle is going. And as you scan in closer on the screen, you'll actually see the vehicles actively moving. It turns into an ant farm almost uh, if you're looking at all the vehicles. Uh, and on that note, uh, the the um, administrators can see all of the district vehicles. Um, so there's three administrators. It's Dan Charlton, Scott Hunter, and myself. Uh, and then the rest of the system is set up uh, based on the organizational uh, structure of the district. So as an example, uh, the stormwater crew chief cannot look over to the sanitation uh, crew chief information and their crews. They really manage their own business structure uh, and keeps them focused on, on their areas of responsibility. Um, so that's a, a benefit to keep people focused on, on what's important. Uh, then we go to the driver safety scorecard that Dan was referencing is on the dashboard. This is emailed on a daily basis. Again, this one shows the administrator level, so the 249 vehicles that were on the road for this particular day. It shows the overall score of 99.1%, and this is an older one, uh, and we picked this one for a, a particular purpose. We can drill down deeper into the scorecard and it will show the driver uh, with the highest risk. And in this case, it was me. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and this was done uh, purposefully to show what the exceptions look like, what the trips would look like, uh, what people would see in the system. Uh, done by a professional, so don't worry about that. Uh, it also shows the total number of miles for the day. It shows the total number of exceptions, which are the the rule uh, outside the rule parameters. And I just want to point out, you'll notice this was in early June, and there were 30 fleet occurrences for that one day. Uh, the past two months, I don't know that we hit 30 exceptions for a month. And so that goes to the point that Dan was making, that there's some really significant improvements in driver behavior. And it was asked if people liked the system. I think there was some apprehension at the very beginning. Uh, I think that there have been uh, things that happen, and I'll show you in a, in a couple of slides, uh, where it has really benefited the employees and, and shown that um, they were not at fault for, for actions on the road, which are hugely beneficial. John, did you have a question? Oh, no, I don't. Well, I was, I was going to say, so this is telling us you had a hard acceleration, is that right? And so I'll show you, yeah, I'll show you an example of that. So, so what we do is we look at this report every morning, and then what we would do is we would say, okay, this driver had these uh, particular exceptions in their route. So then we can pull that route up, the specific route in the system that shows where I drove. So in this case, I left Coachella and, um, number one. And I drove down 52, up Grapefruit, around, and I just did a loop. And you'll see where the route changes. That's where an exception occurs if it's a long enough period of time for the system to recognize it as it's zoomed out. If you zoomed in, you'll see that there's other exceptions that are throughout that route. There were different ones. This one was a seat belt. I took it off just to show what would show in the system. And then if, if it's a short period of time, two or three seconds, then it just shows up as the triangles throughout that route. But you can click on those on a live map, and then it'll take you directly to that. Anytime there is an exception generated in the system, it saves a short video clip. Uh, and so that's what we're going to show you here, is that, um, let's see if I can make this work. Is there a mouse? Uh, so if we could play the video, um, this is the harsh cornering, uh, and the reason we picked this example is, is that, the, oh, thank you. Uh, so I'll play the video, and you'll see that 
let me pause it here for a second. So it shows on the video, it shows the date uh, stamp, the time stamp, shows the GPS coordinates, and then it shows the speed of the vehicle. So you can look at the system and look at the overall uh, event and see if there is a reason why this event occurred. In this case, you'll see that the corner shows it's a 25 mile an hour corner, uh, doing 40 miles an hour, and I'll carry on. And then I simply let off the gas and let it roll around the corner, and it probably just scrubbed off enough speed to get down to the 35 miles an hour. So that would be an event where you would say the driver needs to probably have some counseling and say that you need to watch the speed and the signs and the... I have a question. How, how quickly is the feedback given to the employee? I mean, but same accountability... So generally it's the... Next, pretty, so if the, if the exception report comes in that morning, the crew chiefs and supervisors are talking to the employees the same, that, that very next day. So the, these events would have happened the day before on the report, and they come in and they review that information and then uh, have the discussions with the employees. So it's pr pretty much real time. And I just want to point out one other thing so we can go back here just a little bit of, maybe I'll do it this way. So there's other um, benefits to reviewing these videos. So I'm just, well, I wanted to stop it there. It showed, uh, can I back that up? Okay, so just on that harsh cornering event where you saw me just letting it roll around the corner, there was a vehicle coming the other direction. That particular corner, people cut that corner often. And so when we review the, the video, it also helps us determine whether the, the driver was simply making an evasive maneuver. So they could get a harsh cornering or a harsh braking simply avoiding some kind of an incident. And that would be one where you simply reinforce the good driving behavior, being aware of their situational, you know, the situational awareness, you know, paying attention to what's going on, not assuming drivers are always going to make the right decision. Uh, we've had drivers that had to slam on their brakes because somebody turned on a red light. Um, so it gives us that information that also supports our drivers and, and helps us to, you know, reinforce that good behavior. We have one final video and benefit that we want to show you uh, based on the Surfsite uh, video cameras, which is that whenever a vehicle is in motion on an active trip, it is recording that information. It doesn't necessarily um, create any exceptions, but in this case, our, our driver was going up 74, and he was driving along. Uh, see, he's only doing 32 miles an hour. He's trying to get up to speed. It's an older truck. Um, and you'll notice <laughs> that uh, you'll see off to the left here that uh, there's a vehicle comes in. Oh. And that vehicle makes some contact with our truck and keeps driving. Um, so our driver's now trying to find a space to pull off. But I want to show you. Accelerate. <laughs> Accelerate. Okay. <laughs> that we can take this data and we can get right to it and start going frame by frame and there's the side of the car getting torn off but we could read the license plate and share that information uh, with risk management and they were able to uh, go and recover uh, for damages to our vehicle. There were actually two hit and runs on that same day. Uh, both events, we were able to go back and capture the video from the camera and uh, get the license plate number on both vehicles. Um, so it is benefiting uh, the employees. It's is providing protection for them to, that they're you know, telling the true stories and uh, that they're making the right decisions. Um, Obviously, it also will show if there's mistakes that are made, and we can use those to coach the employees uh, into more awareness and safer driving practices. Uh, and it's working, I think, quite well, as Dan mentioned, that our overall safety score being at almost 99.9% .9 for uh, 12 thousand miles per day is, is pretty remarkable. Uh, the RMJ and Ge Geotab uh, employees that I talk to consistently as we've been implementing this are, are stunned, frankly, at a, a organization of our size that has had this of a, a remarkable of a, of a result in implementation. They're, they're very impressed and use us as examples to other organizations. That's, that is impressive. So um, the purpose of this, I mean, really was, or at least the justification for financing it, 
was uh, that it's going to save us money on our automobile insurance. And I mean, what is our loss ratio re reflecting? Well, we're so we, we're, we're self-insured right now, right? Sorry. Correct. Yeah. We'll we'll move on. Um, you may we are. That thank one. you, Steve. Oh, this is on. This is on there. Now. Well, I haven't looked at. I, I guess for me, um, we we're self-insured now. I we heard the board very clearly. We're trying to change the culture, and now we have the data to be able to provide to insurance companies. So the goal is implement the predictive coaching, implement the lifesaver app, which we had to wait for the Citrix, uh, and IS has done a great job bringing that forward. So implement that before year end, and then in the March time frame, when we have these 100% or other, um, I don't know why that went blank, 100% or other, um, uh, safety scorecards to be able to use the daily scorecards and to prove to the insurance company that we've got significantly safer, safer and we have the data to provide that we are in a different world now. And our, my goal is that in the budget for fiscal year 24 that we actually can, can get our insurance back. That's what we're trying to accomplish. That's one of the main goals. And again, you know, employees are in parking lots and calling us and saying, hey, a car just hit me in the parking lot, and they're, they're not even moving. Mm -hmm. And we, it does protect the employee, it protects the company, it provides additional data and tools to be able to do that. So I think it's a huge win overall. I think with any implementation, their change management's difficult, so employees were a little, little hesitant. I've heard much less concern from employees in the last two to three months that they, they're getting on board. Um, so just to finish up, um, we did the uh, implementation in, in November. We took the vehicle accident and incident prevention policy along with the GeoTab uh, procurement. Uh, we had every employee take training, and they signed a piece of paper acknowledging G the safety concerns and the GeoTab uh, implementation. We've realigned expectations, and I think we can very clearly use the data to show that we've realigned, and we've, we're starting to change the culture significantly. Um, we, have a, we had a committee in place to be able to develop the vehicle accident and incident prevention policy, which is Scott Hunter, myself, Scott Bird, and the rest of my management team, and I think it's been very successful. I think these management tools help us to, you know, to change the culture. And then lastly, uh, we set up a weekly um, accident review panel. Um, Scott Hunter and I are not in the room. Um, it's set up with, if there's an accident or incident in a specific group, we have the two the union leader there that represents that group. We have Chris Chaffins who takes the lead on it. And we have two or three of my management team in a different branch of operation maintenance <coughs> sit in on that. And they determine if it was preventable or not. And then we, we adjust accordingly and move on. So I think that has been very successful as well because it, you know, it has a full cross section of our staff to assess whether it was preventable or not. And again, we're just trying to change the dial. So I think it's been effective. To answer your question, I don't know if they're happy, but I'm happy, so, and so, I think we're going to get our insurance back. Yeah, and I don't know that I heard you answer this. Have we measured, our, is our rate of claims down from what it was? So, it, you know, it, it's a fine line. Um, we are, we, we monitor that on, a, you know, our risk management department in HR uh, manages the accident versus incident. So, you know, it's a fine line. Are our accidents down? I would say yes. Are our incidents down? I think the reportability on our incidents has increased because we've our expectation, we've moved the goalpost. You need to notify us of almost everything and do an incident report. So I'd say small incidents might be up a touch, but large accidents are down definitely over time. And again, we're going to try to compile all this data and manage the data and put it in a fashion that uh, two potential insurance providers that I think will show that, as his point is, for a company of this size to be at 99.87%, that we have truly changed the culture. Yeah, so yeah. No, that's the intent. It's so. uh, it's impressive. So. Uh, is there any uh, discussion or plan to uh, do uh, rear-facing cameras? Yes, there has been discussion. There has been discussion, uh, baby steps, I would say. Um, I, I do think that, you know, first of all, it's hard to get any vehicle right now from any manufacturer, uh, Ford, Chevy, whatever, whoever it may be, we're struggling with that. Um, to even get into a manufacturing queue is difficult. But as we move forward, I think that is uh, very strategic. We have a few with back-facing cameras, but I do think overall it's going to help the employee and the company to do that. It's just at this point in time, 
we're begging for a lot just to get in the manufacturing. No, I, I mean, and, and my, the point of that, I mean, you can see more things, but one of the things you can see, I'm not necessarily advocating it. We haven't done this in my own because mm -hmm. it seems like almost too much, mm -hmm. but too much nanny, you know. But uh, you can see if see people's eyes are on the road or if they're texting. And, and I think texting and being distracted by your phone is probably the big new thing in, in causing well, and, incidents and accidents. And the, the pilot testing we're doing for the Lifesaver app, when it's in, it, when it's in motion, a CBWD phone, it, the screen is blank. They can't text and they can't oh, okay. look well, at that, their email. Yeah, but everyone has two phones. Some their people, personal some phones, have, we can't. Some people have two phones. We can't control their personal phones. But to your yeah. point, uh, we just had an, an incident last week where somebody pulled up to the gate, a new employee, and the gate actually opened this way. So he just went to miss the gate and he went to back up four feet. There was a car right behind him that he couldn't see. So that's a perfect example that in the future, I think that's a smart thing to do, especially I think as we move forward, it'll become cheaper and, and more standard on vehicles, the rear facing cameras. I, I have one question. Will you go back to the map? Which one? This one? That one? Yeah. So on the south side of the sea, you see the cluster of nine or ten vehicles. Do we have a yard there? Yeah, we have a yard there, West Shores. We have a group there. Um, like, domestic is very uh, compartmentalized. Well, we don't have over there. Oh yeah, we have we lots have? of pipelines in that in in that Salt Sea area. We have, I think, three thousand customers or more. No, 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 no. But it, I mean, that 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 seems quite a that that this 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 seems far away from Desert Shores, is it? This here is West Shores. We have a full facility there, and we have people that show up there. They don't even show up to the office. There's a whole group, and again, they're not compartmentalized into I do this. They do everything down in that area to create operational optimization. I think there's eight people on a crew chief and seven people on the crew, and they do everything in that area. So. But our service doesn't go past Desert Shores, right? It's in Salton City. Yeah, Salton City. It's that's Salton City. You can just see underneath of it is Salton City. Yeah. We have. A, a lot of pipe, a lot of old pipe from the 60s and 70s, some of it ACP. They do a heck of a job down there. So our, our well that feeds that goes that far? We, we <laughs> got rid of some of our, we, we have a new... Um, we, we, had, we had three wells at Avenue 86, sorry, County Line. Right, but that, um, and that's a long way though. And um, it was a... Mile pipeline or something. Yeah, Fourteen mile pipeline. But we've recently um, taken those wells offline because we've connected them to the Avenue um, Highway 86 transmission main. So the water that Salton City is getting now comes from um, either Middleton Road, um, where the K through 12 school is, or further north um, along um, Airport Boulevard. Yeah, yeah, we had three wells, and we shut those off as soon as we commissioned the transmission. Yeah. yeah just curious, because yeah. I, I wasn't wasn't familiar with that area where CBWD had. Yeah, we actually there. we have a couple of reservoirs on and that side of booster well, stations and a the road whole too. Yeah. series of, of pipes that need to be replaced. And, and obviously, <laughs> the, the, the canal goes the canal goes 110 miles south to the right. on the other. That's where we have that meeting where they were daring us to drink the water. Yeah. Which we did. I did. I drank it. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> Still alive. With that, we just want to give you an update. I think it's going well. We're going to implement the phase B in the next four to six weeks. So we're, we're very pleased thus far. And I wanted to thank you guys for providing this, the procurement of the materials. Uh, and I want to thank, uh, you know, my team, Scott Hunter's team, Matt, Stu, Chad, uh, for helping move this forward. I think it's been a success. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Dan and Stuart. Yeah, good. Good, good. Um, well, that reminds me of I teenagers. I gotta, can't get away with it. Where can I anymore? <laughs> <We're>, um, <laughs> where are we? So this gets us to board general comments. Why don't we start with uh, Director Nelson? John, let me know if you continue to get the feedback. I think that I hear a repeat um, or an echo, which may be the problem. You sound good, actually. Okay, great. 
Hey, so, uh, no, I don't have many comments except for the fact that, uh, hey, we did get our first storm through the uh, Rockies. Uh, Utah got 19 inches of snow, and uh, uh, there's a couple more. May hit a little bit north of uh, our Colorado River watershed, but uh, uh, it's great to see. Thank That's you. All I have. Um, I'm good. Thanks, Peter. I'm good, Jim. Okay. I don't know if this is, I don't know if I want to make it a, a, an agenda item, but um, I, I just wanted to know when are we going to finish the landscaping here in Coachella where we put the wall up? Are we going to, we have plans for that? To landscape it? Okay. Yeah, we, we've done some subtle uh, landscaping, but we, we're continuing to work on the area up front and we're going to continue on that. We're trying to make it minimal. Okay. We're letting it grow. We're letting it grow. We have planted some trees. In it. Okay, but I mean, be between where the where the road is and the wall is, we're going to put some landscaping so it looks better than it does now, which is like just blank, plain. Well, at one point, the uh, city council uh, at Coachella uh, was interested in painting a mural on that wall, um, but I haven't heard anything from them uh, at all since that initial concert conversation. Um, you know, I was concerned that as soon as they did something on the wall, it'd get tagged. And they said, oh, no, no, they don't, they don't tag murals uh, out here. I said, all right, well, it's a different kind of experience, but, you know, we'll see. Um, they were supposed to select someone and, and basically cover the cost. This, we, we got into this because of the blue water tower that they also had an interest in. But eventually we told them that, you know, it just wasn't going to be feasible for us to relocate it somewhere else. And it created a liability if it was left there that we would, of course, ask the city to handle uh, if something were to happen. And, of course, that made it very unattractive. But, uh, at, you know, the, the mural on the wall just hasn't gone anywhere. So maybe after the election uh, we get uh, some new people or at least some people that feel a little more secure in their position. Um, we can probe it again, but I haven't heard anything from them at all. Well, I'm not really yeah. interested in mural, but I just want to know if sure. it's the landscape that area to make it look a little better. Yeah, we will never do oleanders again. Um, you saw you saw the vandalism that was done and the fire that was created. It cost us a lot of money. But we have planted some landscaping that will mature, and once that gets further along, we will evaluate that process and then continue on once it matures a little bit. So. Just need a little time. Thanks. And following on that comment, I did drive by that Alamo tank up in mm -hmm. your tank. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of landscaping up there. We looks, got our money's worth. It looks pretty good. Um, accelerated. Yeah, there was a little accelerated growth on some of that. Make it look mature at the beginning. That was my tank. That's yeah, your tank. <laughs> you go up and tag that? that There's a lot of plants. I don't know if you've been by, but I was curious, so I went by. Uh, that's my only comment. So, uh, do we have any board requests for future agenda items? Hearing none. Why don't we get into the board meeting reports? Uh, the first four we'll, we'll save for later, Director Estrada, and then. Uh, Let's see, October 12th, Colorado River Board, Director Nelson. Yeah, we met on October 12th, Wednesday. Uh, I was there, I chaired the meeting. A uh, uh, lot of uh, just hydrology updates uh, to that, <clears throat> as well as an executive session to uh, discuss uh, uh, some of the alternative uh, accounting measures that uh, the other states are trying to impose on California. Thank you. And we'll uh, talk about that in closure. Yeah. Uh, October 13, Salt and Sea Authority, uh, Director Bianco. Uh, we had a financial report. We had a follow the law discussion on Colorado River shortages and possibly impact in Salt and Sea in the region. Yeah, good. Thanks. Um, let's see. We had. Um, on the 17th, you had a meeting regarding yeah, so yeah, efficiency the, um, payments. When did the, when the, I guess, the bureau 
Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Can't hear Bianco. What our plans, what our plans were going forward. What they I wanted to know. I wanted to know staff's thoughts on what they thought, what we should do. So. Thank you. Uh, there was a DVBA board meeting on October 17th that I attended. It was a pretty standard uh, issue for that. Um, October 18th, uh, Director Aguilar and I. Um, we're here for a meeting with the uh, project um, proponents on Volvo Ranch Mirage, and uh, we appreciate staff uh, uh, working with them to help move that project forward at a more reasonable cost. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> did you hear? You heard? Did you hear what happened? Yes. Apparently, there was a stray one on the. It was supposed to be 531, and it was 1531. Yeah. But, you know, if we hadn't got together, they may never have figured that out. So thank you. Yeah, Director Aguilar, if you had anything else. No, I'm, I'm good, Jeff. Thanks. <laughs> October 19th, um, there was a very popular speaker at the <laughs> DVBA lunch. I notice he's not even listed as president. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, Colorado River Board uh, Chair Peter Nelson presented, and uh, it was a packed house, let's put it that way. And uh, it was really good, Peter. I mean, kind of a bit of an egghead uh, Colorado River thing, uh, but I really appreciated it, and I think other people did also. Yeah, I'm I'm a real egghead, uh, John, and uh, actually what the request was is to give uh, kind of a similar report that I did over at the uh, Salton Sea Symposium a few months earlier, and so that was the report they requested, so that's, that's what the report I gave, but uh, I thought it went over pretty well. I had some pretty good feedback uh, uh, from a number of people and appreciated the eggheadiness of it, and uh uh, but, you know, really describing the hydrology and uh, some of the actions that the river community has taken on the river and then what some of the challenges will be coming up. So, so thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Uh, 24th. Uh, so I think I'm next. I, yeah. I was not able to attend the uh, California Farm Water Coalition. Okay, and then the next one is Director Strata. So are there any other meetings that we need to report on? Yes, sir, I have a couple. Um, on uh, the 17th, there was a seven Basin State uh, Santa Fe uh, follow-up um, with the seven states um, discussing uh, what, what the next discussion topics would be. Um, as a follow-up on their evaporation uh, challenges um, to the system. That was, uh, so seven basin states on uh, October 17th. Uh, then on October 20th and 21st, uh, we got together at seven basin states, USBR and uh, Department of Interior. Uh, Steve Abbott and I attended that meeting um, to discuss um, some of the similar issues, uh, trying to identify actions to be taken in 2023, uh, speaking with the uh, Bureau on a little more clarity on what the uh, funding opportunities would be under the recently rolled out um, Infrastructure Reduction Act uh, money that's available. Um, again, um, talking about uh, some of the evaporative losses in the lower basin. Uh, and so that was on the October 20th and 21st. That's it. Thank you. There is. Any others? Uh, is there a motion to approve the meetings report per diem for the meetings reported on? I'll make a motion. I'll second that. I'll second. Please, second. Whatever. Uh, roll call, please. President Powell. Aye. Director Bianco. Aye. Director Aguilar. Aye. And Director Nelson. Aye. That Thank passed you. 4 uh, General Manager report. 
Yes, sir. Um, I can report that we have made an offer that was accepted by our candidate for director finance position, who will be reporting to us on uh, November 7th. And just recently, we had uh, the executive, a new executive assistant report to us uh, this uh, yesterday, uh, Julia Breyer from uh, College of the Desert. So she'll be working with uh, Sylvia um, in uh, Palm Desert. Uh, as far as COVID goes, we've got uh, two qualifying cases, so two folks off work right now, six qualifying cases for the month of October, and 453 people have shown documented proof of vaccination status. So uh, that's, uh, that's a pretty good number. Um, we did recently see there was a news article that talked about um, the, required, the Biden administration requirement to vaccinate uh, federal contractors. Uh, although the courts have ruled that is only applicable in the states that have uh, filed those lawsuits, the Biden administration has basically told everybody else to stay the course. Um, we'll be waiting to see whether any of the federal agencies actually incorporate language. But at this point, I am highly doubtful that that particular initiative will move forward. Uh, and do, I do not expect to continue to mandate our folks get vaccinated uh, until we get directed otherwise. And that's all I've got, sir. Thank you. Uh, council report? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, AB 2142 uh, was adopted, which uh, deals with the tax exemption from gross income for anyone who received a turf rebate. It's a big accomplishment there. And then two other bills, AB 2647 and SB 100, uh, deal with other nuances to the Brown Act uh, that if and when they become available or need to be used, uh, we'll certainly work with the board clerk for that. But trying to expedite and make Brown Act posting agendas and, and procedures uh, more flexible. That's all I have. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, any departmental reports today? No, sir. I don't see anybody jumping up. So, at this time, the board will recess into closed session to consider the items on the agenda as amended earlier in the meeting, and we will reconvene uh, in open session to report out of closed session uh, following that. hereby reconvene we have no reportable actions from closed session and with no further business we are adjourned goodbye